Good morning. Just a three minute review of what we did last week in case you weren't there or forgot. We started talking last week about the medieval period in Jewish history. And the uh, very quick review is that it wasn't until the medieval era. And when I say medieval, I'm talking 10th, 11th, 12th century, mostly centralized in the Iberian Peninsula, so Portugal, Spain, southern France. And the medieval period brought about this big clash within Judaism. And the clash was mainly between the new translations of Greek works that were translated into Arabic and started spreading throughout the Islamic world and classical Jewish ideas. And so last week we talked about a number of ramifications, but you can imagine an entire generation of Jews who were brought up on the Tanakh and the Talmud and very anthropomorphic depictions of God, right? You read through the stories of the Torah in Shul every week, or you study Talmud, or you study Midrash and rabbinic literature, and week after week, you're getting these very vivid pictures of God and miracles and everything there. And all of a sudden, you start to see Aristotle and Plato and all these works, and they are discussing God as a much more abstract, much more omnipotent and infinite picture of God that, again, clashes with a very vivid and anthropomorphic picture. So you have originally Maimonides, who is the first major philosopher to really tackle this question head on. And Maimonides is primarily interested in philosophy. And so Maimonides develops his massive corpus, Guide to the Perplex, arguing that you can't give God any descriptors. And to give God any descriptors, right, I'm not talking about specific descriptors, right? Obviously, Maimonides would say it's bad to say that God is a six foot tall old man with a gray beard, right? Maimonides goes further and Maimonides says, don't even say that God has any attributes. Don't say that God is just. Don't say that God is righteous. Don't say that God cares, right? Any of these things are fundamentally limiting. And so Maimonides begins to change Judaism from the inside to a religion that has, again, very vivid pictures of God to a very hyper-philosophical, hyper-rationalistic view of Judaism, where all of a sudden, God becomes this abstract concept that it's very hard to actually initiate any connection to. Enter the Zohar one or two generations later, and the Zohar, as we discussed last week, picks up where Maimonides leaves off, but then introduces a major wrinkle. And one of the things that we discussed last week is the Zohar begins with the premise of God is infinite, God is ineffable, God is not tangible in any way, right? In the language of sort of the uh, the later uh, Hasidic thinkers that were building off of the Zohar, God is fully transcendent, right? God transcends everything in this world. God is known in Kabbalah as the Ein Sof, right? For those who speak Hebrew, Ein Sof means that which is without end or the infinite, and so, great, that is the philosophic picture of God. But as we saw last week, the Zohar begins to introduce another side of God, which is the human-centric side of God. And one of the things that we'll start today's discussion on, where the Zohar breaks God basically into two different conceptual pieces. Now, I don't mean to say that the Zohar has views God as being two, even though a lot of uh, philosophic thinkers at the time, one of the uh, major uh, critiques of the Zohar was that it was very similar to the Christian view of the Trinity. So that certainly was a criticism that a lot of contemporary Jews at the time of the Zohar levied. But the Zohar, as we saw last week, comes up with this theology of the world that in order to create a universe, God actually needed to break out of the infinite, break out of the transcendent nature of God, and in some way become a little bit finite, become a little bit imminent in the world. So with that background, I want to do um, one text, then we'll uh, talk, hopefully have a discussion a little bit, and then we can um, then we can spend some time discussing it. Give me one second to share my screen. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. I think this should be good. Okay. So one of the things that we started to see last week, 
and probably one of the most radical ideas, not, not just in Kabbalah, but I would argue in all of Judaism, is the way that Kabbalah and specifically the Zohar plays around with gender, right? For, for anybody in the Jewish world, right, whether you're steeped in Tanakh or Talmud or medieval philosophy, to think about God as having a male and female half sounds beyond heretical, right? This is something that perhaps the ancient pagans, right, if you read through the Torah very carefully, one of the things that you notice is the Tanakh, describes the pagan nations as having different gendered aspects of God. So the most obvious one, and this is where the Kabbalah becomes a little bit radical, is you read through the Torah, especially Deuteronomy, Devarim, where we are in this week's Parshiot, and you see the Torah constantly talking about Asherah, right? This idea of an Asherah, which a lot of biblical historians will tell you the Asherah in ancient Canaanite religion was considered the consort or the female half or whatever you want to call it, the queen of the god Baal, who was one of the head Canaanite gods. So the idea that God has gender or that God involves male and female components is an ancient pagan idea that the Tanakh and the Talmud spent pages and pages and hundreds and hundreds of chapters trying to repudiate. All of a sudden, the Zohar brings back in this highly anthropomorphic genderized picture into the mix. And here is one of the texts of the Zohar that ends up being the most radical, and then we'll discuss. So the Zohar begins and says, when coming to the world of separation, which is the world of separate things. So just to uh, give a little bit of sprinkled commentary there, the Zohar describes this world as the world of separation. Why is it the world of separation? Because it does not involve God, right? Again, for God to create the world in the philosophy of the Zohar, God, there had to be some separation because if God is infinite, as the Zohar understands God to be, right? God is the Ein Sof, there's no room for anything that's outside of infinity. And so the fact that we exist, the fact that there's such thing as saying, you know, there's Daniel and there's Rosalie and there's Susan and there's Megan, right? The very fact that we have identities that aren't just part of God, means in some way that God has pulled back and God has separated. And so this world is considered the world of separation. And so the Zohar says, when coming to the world of separation, which is the world of separated things, the builder said to the master of the edifice, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, right? We should all be familiar with this verse. This is the verse in the book of Genesis when God is saying that he wants to create humankind. So God is saying, right, let's make man, right? I want to create humanity. I want to create, you know, beings that are separate. So the master of the edifice, right? It's unclear exactly who that is, right? You know, potentially the uh, the chief angel or God's chief uh, servant or, you know, different parts of God talking within himself. This is a, a theme, by the way, for those who are confused, even the Midrash, right, earlier rabbinic works very much has this theme of, you know, different parts of God or different angels debating when God's about to create humanity. Um, but the master of the edifice says, indeed, it would be good to make him, but he is destined to sin before you since he is a foolish son. As it is written in Proverbs, a wise son makes glad a father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother, right? So the master of the edifice says to God, it's great that you want to... Uh, create humanity, but humanity is going to mess up, right? Humanity is going to be sinful. Humanity is going to do things that are wrong. Humanity is going to be foolish and it's going to be a bunch of grief. And the angel or the master of the edifice quotes this verse from Proverbs, right? In Mishle in the Tanakh and says, right? A foolish son is the grief of his mother, right? Humanity is just going to be painful and it's just going to cause God grief. So here is what the Zohar says, right? This is probably one of the most radical paragraphs in Jewish literature. Whereupon she, the Ima, right? And so now this is the feminine aspect of God, right? The motherly aspect of God says, since his sin relates to Ima and not Abba, I want to create him in my image, right? So now the feminine aspect of God, later the Zohar will uh, interpret this as the Shrina, right? This idea of God as the feminine, right? So the mother, the divine mother says, well, the verse in Proverbs says a foolish son 
is grief upon the mother. So I want to create humankind as it is written. And God created man in his image, right? The, the, the his, right? There's a lot of interesting uh, playing around with gender here, right? Just to uh, take a step back, the first time in the book of Genesis that God creates humanity, it uses a plural, right? Let us make man in our image. The second time it mentions it in Genesis, it's singular, right? It's singular male, but the Zohar is, is picking up on this. And for those who, who uh, this is a little bit beyond the scope of this specific passage, but the Zohar is commenting on why the plural and then why the singular, right? How come the first time God creates humanity, it's let us make man in our image. And the second time it's God made man in his image, right? It uses the singular. So the Zohar is saying, well, obviously, originally there was a multiplicity within God, right? The male and female. And the second time there was only one, the Zohar is interpreting this as the female. So here is what happened. And then I'll, I'll review again, because this is uh, quite cryptic, right? But Abba did not want to participate in man's creation, right? So the divine feminine, the divine mother, Shrina, whatever we call it, wanted to create humankind. They did. And the divine Abba or the masculine aspects of God, or, you know, let's say capital G God, did not want to create humanity. And so Abba took a backseat. At the time that man sinned, right? So this is obviously talking about eating from the tree of knowledge. What is written? And for your transgression was your mother sent away, right? Another quote from Tanakh, but a, a, a verse saying, right? For your sins, the mother was sent away. And so how is the Zohar interpreting this? The king Abba said to Ima, did I not say to you that he is destined to sin? At that time, he, Abba, drove him, man, away and drove away Ima with him, right? So... At that time, the divine masculine or the king or Abba or whatever you want to contextualize it sent humankind away, right? This is the banishment from the Garden of Eden, but at the same time also sent the divine feminine away with humanity. And so all of a sudden, within this, uh, this sort of origin story of the world, right, you thought the first three chapters of the Torah, right, of Genesis was a story of mankind separation from God. And that is, of course, classically how the text is understood. It's how it's understood by the rabbis. It's how it's understood by a whole host of Jewish thinkers is that humankind has sinned and has distanced themselves from God. And the rest of the Torah is trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. Fine. That's very much a uh, rabbinic and midrashic interpretation of the story. The Zohar is saying, no, no, no. The Garden of Eden didn't just separate man from God, it actually separated God, right? God used to be a, a plural. God used to be we. God used to be, you know, a say a happy couple, right? An Ima and Abba, right? A mom and dad of humanity. And during the creation and during the story of the Garden of Eden, God actually split into multiplicity, into a male and female aspect. And the female aspect becomes identified with humanity, and specifically later on with the Jewish people, the fatherly aspect, right, the Abba aspect is associated with taking a step back, basically saying the, uh, the fatherly aspect of God does not want to have any interaction with humanity. And the rest of the Zohar becomes a quest to try to reunite these two aspects of God, right? It sounds, it sounds absolutely radical and heretical, but the entire Zohar, in some sense, is based around this foundational idea that it's not just humans that have distanced themselves from God, but actually God internally, there has been a great schism or a great breaking. And we'll talk about this in about 10 minutes. I'll take some uh, some room for questions. The rest of the Zohar becomes a series of tasks and a recipe for actually reuniting God. And so the goal of Kabbalah Unlike rabbinic Judaism, right, and obviously Kabbalah is under the framework of rabbinic Judaism, but rabbinic Judaism is, is very normative in the sense of you do good things because it helps you, it helps your community, right? You want to go to, you know, in some rabbinic formulations, you want to go to heaven, right? You want to live a just life, right? Whatever the reasons are, Kabbalah says, no, the reason to do good things or the reason to practice Torah is not 
only for yourself, not only for the world, but it's actually because God needs you to, right? There's something deficient within God. God is not whole. And if you want to repair the world, right? And I'll introduce this idea of Tikkun Olam repairing the world in a few minutes, because this is where it comes from. You actually need to go out and reunite God um, in itself. I'll take one or two minutes for questions, any clarifying anything, and then we'll uh, move on a bit. Daniel, I, I sent you a note. It's Rosalie. I did not get the note, so I apologize. The chat. It's in the chat. I don't see it. Maybe you okay. sent it to the collaborative. <laughs> I don't know where I sent it. Okay, I just wanted to know, Is um, this is Rosalie. Is that where the expression Seem Tsum comes from? Is this Was it created here? Yeah, so Zohar? Seem Tsum. Yes, yeah, so, so yes. Um, the, the Zohar itself doesn't explicitly use the term Tsimtsum. Just to just to translate, um, just for people that aren't familiar, Tsimtsum literally means a contraction, but Tsimtsum is, the, is this Kabbalistic idea that for God to create, God had to contract at the beginning. That idea is developed later by the, um, by the Kabbalists in Sfat. So Kabbalah went through two major, um, two um, major evolutionary stages, and we'll probably discuss the second one a little bit more in the last class. The first stage was this medieval Spain, right? Building on Maimonides, that's, that's when the Zohar was produced and everything there. And then later on, after the uh, Spanish Inquisition and the expulsion from Spain in 1492, much of the Sephardic Jews ended up going to the Middle East. A lot of them landed in the modern day land of Israel, specifically in the town of Sfat. And then Sfat is when a whole host of new Jewish ideas were developed. For those interested in Jewish law, that's when uh, Joseph Cairo wrote the Shulchan Orech, which is still to this day the most important Jewish legal work. But it's also where Isaac Luria or the Arizal wrote his uh, Kabbalistic uh, philosophies. And he's the one who really develops that idea of Tsimtsum. But it's obvious um, that he gets that from the Zohar, right? This idea that God had to contract to create. So yeah, Rosalie, great question. Other thoughts, questions? Perfect. Okay. So with, with that background, right, I'm going to guess anybody who's who's ever delved into Kabbalah a little bit has seen in some way these 10 spherot. Um, usually they're just kind of, right, for, for, for many years I was very confused by this. I mean, I'm, I'm still a little bit confused because I think that's sort of the point because the Zohar fundamentally encompasses a paradox. And so one of one of the things that the Zohar keeps going back to is at the end of the day, you really aren't supposed to be able to fully understand this because as we kept saying last week, the Zohar keeps falling back on this idea of mitzad shalanu, right? This is true from our side. And so the Zohar would say, right, just going back to, to the last slide for a second before we even tackle the Svirot, it is true that God is infinite and indescribable, right? That is true. It is also true that God has male and female aspects that were one time united and are disunited and humans need to put back together. That is also true. What happens when they, someone points out they obviously contradict each other? The Zohar says, okay, well, they're true in different ways, right? From the philosophic, from the capital T truth perspective, it is true to say, that God is ineffable, right? Maimonides was right about that. You can't describe God. But from our human perspective or from the way that we understand the world and the universe, it is also true to say these other things about God. And the Zohar constantly plays around with that paradox. And so unlike, again, the, the genius of the Zohar and why it's made such an impact on Judaism and also why it continues to be the most quote unquote upsetting book within Judaism. And what I mean by that is the Zohar has had more criticism from Jews than probably any other book. Maybe Maimonides is also up there is because all other Jewish thinkers try to answer the question of how can God both be tangible and imminent and in our lives and also infinite, right? That is a paradox. So Maimonides says, you're right. God is only infinite. God is not tangible, right? Maimonides says there's no such thing as miracles. There's no such thing as talking to God, right? Even prophecy, according to Maimonides, 
is not really God talking to you. Prophecy is a very rationalistic, um, is a very rationalistic process where if, you know, I spend 20 years studying physics and math and science, obviously I know more about the world than somebody who spent 20 years sitting in a cave doing nothing. And so that's prophecy according to Maimonides, right? So Maimonides answers this question by saying, you're right, God is infinite. Other Jewish thinkers answer this question by saying, you're right, God is tangible and doesn't address this idea of God being infinite. The Zohar says they're both true at the same time. God is both infinite and God is also finite in a way that humans can recognize. And so to do this, the Zohar leans into paradox. And the Zohar, after establishing this idea of multiplicity within God, develops this idea of the ten spherot. Now, one of the uh, one of the ways to understand the, the ten spherot is, again, very much through this lens of gender. And so the Zohar spends a lot of time talking about this, but even you can look at this, um, at this chart on the left. Typically, one side or one idea tends to be more masculine. Again, these are very um, classical gender stereotypes, but one side tends to be more masculine and one side tends to be more feminine, right? So you can see here with, um, say, with Bina, which is understanding, and Chachma, which is wisdom, right? So Bina, in a number of um, of occasions in the Zohar, is associated with being sort of the divine womb, whereas Chachma is seen as being the, you know, the, the beginning or the premise of a logical argument. So already you see a difference between understanding, which in Kabbalah is associated with much more of a emotional intelligence, Chachma, which is associated with a lot more of sort of, uh, say, rationalistic intelligence or uh, or anything like that, right? EQ versus IQ. And even there, Kabbalah is saying, well, there's different aspects of God there, right? There's the more emotional understanding aspect of God. There's the more rationalistic understanding of God. And those are intention, right? And the Zohar continues to build this picture of God that, God is intention within God's self, right? It's it's quite a fascinating idea. It's an idea that actually the rabbis develop a little bit in the Talmud also, right? Probably the most famous one that the rabbis play around with that is also at the center of the Zohar is Gevura and Chesed, right? Just to, uh, just to remind us what that is, Chesed is grace or kindness. Gevura is strength. And so the 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 tension that the rabbis already were dealing with in the Midrash, they don't take it to the logical conclusion, is that if God is a judge, is God a truthful judge or is God a merciful judge, right? Those two things cannot both be true at the same time, right? If Shirley goes and robs, you know, a Trader Joe's, the honest, truthful thing to do would be to send your, you know, Shirley to jail for robbing the Trader Joe's, right? That is the side of, of Dean or Emmet or Gevura, right? The merciful thing to do would be for the judge to say, okay, you know what? People make mistakes, but if Shirley repents or if Shirley, you know, realizes what she did was wrong, then we can forgive her and no need to send her to jail, right? That is called chesed or in other ways, rachamim or in other ways, teshuva, right? The idea of repentance, we're going to talk about that a lot during the high holidays in a month and a half. But these two ideas are in conflict, right? You can't have both. You can't have truth and mercy at the same time. This is, in some sense, this is the entire uh, thesis of the book of Jonah, by the way, right? Jonah is told to tell this city Nineveh to repent and he doesn't want to. And so he runs away and he is upset at God at the end that God allowed this evil city to repent. And if you notice, Jonah's name in Tanakh is Yonah ben Amitai, Amitai in Hebrew, of course, is from emet, which means truth. So Jonah, the man of truth, is upset that God allows repentance. So we have this theme all throughout Jewish literature before. But the Zohar says this is an internal contradiction within God. This is part of the brokenness of the world. The fact that you have strength or truth or justice and the fact that you have grace or, or mercy or teshuva. And so all over the place, what the Zohar points out is you see this tension within the universe, this tension within God, and the world is not in harmony. And over and over again, right, connected to what Rosalie um, asked before about Tzim Tzum, right, this is all connected back to this initial breaking of God. And all of a sudden, our world 
instead of being a perfect world that's in harmony, is a world that's broken, there's multiplicity, there's different ideas, there's different laws of, of God and everything there. And so the Zohar, again, over hundreds of pages, develops this thesis and allows humans, and then I'll take, Rosalie, I'll take your question in one second, humans could connect to different aspects of God within the Zohar. Um, go for it, Rosalie. Yeah, I, for, for years, I mean, I've never understood this, but I thought that the female was on the left side and the male's attributes were on the right. But I see here, like when you've got uh, Gavura power or strength, that seems to be on the female side and love is on the male side. I, 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 talk to me. <laughs> Yeah, so I will say um, this this chart, right? Just as some uh, some you know hi historical background, this chart itself never actually appears in the Zohar. Um, and if you notice, a lot of these charts are a little bit different in terms of exactly how they're formulated. Um, I only say that because this is drawn up based off of an interpretation of the Zohar. Now, it doesn't mean it's an incorrect interpretation, but I wouldn't read too much into how this is organized structurally. Okay. It's, it's more the, uh, the the concepts of the idea that there is a male half or is a female half, um, everything there. I mean, on, on the bottom, right, this idea of Shrina or in other formulations, Mahut, right? Mahut means, uh, means, no. means kingship. <laughs> Shrina, again, is the feminine aspect of God. That in the Sefiro ends up being sort of the, uh, the, the lowest down aspect because that's the aspect that's the most relatable to humankind, right? It goes within the interpretation of the Shrina being the more tangible part of God. And so from, from the Zohar's perspective, when you connect to God, <laughs> Right. And the Zohar believes that, of course, connecting to God is, is is possible. God is everywhere. God is tangible. Right. There are miracles. There is prophecy. Right. The Zohar brings all that back into play. You are then only connecting to Shrina. Right. This one aspect of God that's more tangible. But the entire goal is to collapse the spirit. And so the Zohar talks about this, uh, this formulation of there being the 10 different attributes of God. But at the end of the day, the goal was to connect the top, which is keter, which means literally means crown, but it's associated with um, with the Ein Sof, or this idea of the intangible part of God, with Shrina, which is the tangible part of God. Everything else there just exists within this tension. So, so this is all, in some sense, a a tragedy that that this exists. And so, reading to right, so so you're right that a lot of times it. it it plays around, but in a lot of different charts of the Sphero, these will end up being on, on different sides um, and everything like that. I hope that addresses the, the question. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Sylvia, go for it. Okay. Thanks, Rabbi. I, pardon my baritone for a bit. Um, I'd like to go back a minute, though, because um, I, um, I get stuck on something, and then I, it's hard for me to follow the rest of it. Uh, when we were talking about Maimonides and the rational thinking and how that is so important to him, and that's what it is, all that intelligence and the intelligent mind comes to the right answers. Um, okay, I always thought that, and I'm, obviously I was wrong, but maybe you could quali uh, qualify this, or um, that I always thought that that what he said meant that um, when an intelligent, truly rational, intelligent being gets to these wonderful thoughts and ideas, they actually came from God, but he didn't have to talk to God. He just thought about them. And God said, put him in his brain, basically. Not put him in his brain, but, you know, but that came from God. And I think I heard you saying something a little different. Yeah. So just to review Maimonides' um, view of, of prophecy in the world, Maimonides' view is that God created the world. So he does um, he does describe, you know, an act of, right? So my, Maimonides says that God exists and that God probably created the world, right? 
he's he's even a little bit ambivalent about that because at times he seems to um play around with Aristotle's idea of maybe the universe was always here. But for Maimonides, God is a, a logical necessity, right? The world exists. There is something rather than nothing. You look around and the spheres are moving, right? The sun rises and sets. Someone, some, some force needed to set that into motion. That is God. Everything after that, according to Maimonides, the universe obviously, according to Maimonides, obviously, bears the imprint of God. Because if God created the universe or God set everything in the universe into motion, then of course the creation is going to bear the imprint of, of the creator in some way. And so the only way to understand God, according to Maimonides, is through understanding the universe, right? Via philosophy or metaphysics or science or, or anything there. And so for Maimonides, it's sort of one in the same. He has a line that says in the Guide to the Perplexed, um, which basically says, you know, the reason why the Torah says that X, Y, and Z happened because of God, in some way it's right, it's just skipping a bunch of steps. So, so it is correct to say if the sea split, let's say this is one of his examples, it's correct to say that God split the sea, but if you really understood it, it means that God created the world and the world has certain laws of nature and the laws of nature act in A, B, and C way. And if you understand the ways that nature acts in A, B, and C way, then you understand that, you know, natural either disasters or natural events can happen. And then you understand that sometimes seas can split with, you know, great gusts of wind. Okay. So if you're really paying attention, right, this is what Maimonides says, you understand that when the Torah says God made the sea split, the Torah is just skipping all the intermediary steps. But as Maimonides says over and over again, the Torah was written for sort of a, a mass audience, right? Maimonides' whole thing is that the Torah is, is written for the, the uneducated masses. And so the uneducated masses, right, you know, they don't need to think too hard about it. The Torah just says, okay, God made the sea split. So that's sort of Maimonides' view, um, and, it, and it goes throughout everything. Um, but yeah. Rabbi, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this it says, how can many come from one? Maybe we should ask, how come one come from many? If you look at the birth of a child, you need both male and female. For so therefore, we carry both of this in our, you know, in our genetics this both male and female side. And so in order to, for man to create and sustain the, you know, their stay on earth, you constantly will need both male and female to be brought together. And so does the Zohar see like, maybe there's a different, you know, that in order to have a complete God, you need both male and female, but we don't have that situation in the physical realm on earth. I think so. I think just to just to interpret what you're asking, the, the Zohar is obviously using the tools that the humans understand, right? So this this whole thing is a metaphor, right? And, and yeah. th this is what I think the Zohar keeps coming back to. The 10 spherot or the male and female aspects of God is all a metaphor for us to be able to understand these very cryptic, complex ideas that, that actually make no sense, right? This is, you know, what the Zohar kind of keeps falling back to. Humans understand what it is like to say that a man and a man and woman or husband and wife, say, are, are one, right? And also mul multiple, right? And so this is one of the images that the Zohar keeps on falling back to is, okay, we know what it's like if you say this couple... Or, you know, as as Genesis says, right, a man and woman shall, you know, become one, but they're also there's also multiplicity. And one of the the the, the tragedies, I mean, this is, you know, every uh, book or poem or, you know, movie ever written about love is always this, uh, you know, the tragedy of separateness, that no matter how close you are to another human being, there's always something that's separating the two. And so in some way, this is the same tragedy about about God, either within itself or God and humankind that no matter how much man wants to connect with God, there's always some separation. And so it, it, it's all part of the same um, metaphor because as we discussed last week, 
This is something that a lot of uh, modern philosophers point out, but one of the things that the Zohar certainly understood is we just have a problem with language. I mean, language is just not developed enough, or perhaps it's impossible to use language to describe certain things, right? So the the example that I just keep going back to, because I think it's the best one, is love, right? Just like it, you can't describe love using language, right? You know, modern philosophers will also say, you know, colors, right? Can, you know, if somebody has never seen red before or say somebody's colorblind and can't see the color red, can you ever describe to them what red looks like? And the answer is, of course, no, right? You can give the properties of red. You can, you know, describe the wavelength and you can say, you know, but there's obviously no way to describe red. So you can give metaphors, right? The same way with love. If I'm trying to describe what it's like to love somebody, I can give metaphorical descriptions and that probably helps in understanding a little bit. But for anybody that actually understands what love is, they know that these things are all metaphors. So it's the exact same way with the Zohar. The Zohar understands that the average reader will will realize that this this uh, this disconnect or tragedy or tension that exists between, you know, again, highly, uh, you know, stereotypical gender roles, but between the male and the female components and that all couples have this clash. And even inside of us, we have this clash in terms and societies have this clash of how you know merciful do you want to be versus how much of strict justice do you want to be and so these same ideas we can begin to understand you know the brokenness within within god the same way and so any one of these metaphors i would caution against reading too much into the zohar is just trying to give a very vivid description of of describing something that at the end of the day is 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 indescribable and so Right. There's actually a really interesting just to um just to go a little bit uh, a little bit more. This is another source from the Zohar that I think will uh, help answer this question. The Zohar um, talks about the difference between exoteric or esoteric. And just to uh, translate those words, exoteric, right? X is is external, right? So exoteric is the external interpretation of the Torah, and esoteric is the deep secrets of the Torah. And the Zohar says as follows. It says, woe to the person who thinks the Torah comes simply to tell stories and speaks of earthly matters. If that were so, even in our times, we can make a Torah and we can make a better job out of it, right? So the Zohar says, right, you think you're opening up the Torah and you're reading, you know, stories, even if they're, you know, very interesting, deep stories, right? The Zohar says, you know, something that probably um, many of us who have uh, sat in shul week after week reading the Parshas, you know, I can probably, or, you know, we can probably write a better Torah today if we tried, right? So the Zohar says, you know, woe to the person who thinks the Torah is only talking about these stories. If Torah is just a tell of matters of this world, then the famous people of the world today have much better stories to tell. We would chase after them and compose a Torah from them. Rather, all the words of the Torah are sublime matters and deep secrets. Come and see. There is a higher world and a lower world, and the two are in a single balance. Israel is below, and the angels are way above. That is why when one of these angels comes below, it must dress itself in clothing of this world. If it would not do so, it would not be able to enter this world, and the world would not be able to endure it. If this is so with angels, how much more so with the Torah that creates those angels and creates the entire world for which the entire world is sustained. If the Torah would enter this world without being dressed in earthly clothing, the world would not be able to endure. So the, the Zohar is again using another uh, metaphor, this time a, a biblical metaphor. The metaphor is that every time the Torah says that angels, you know, pop in and do something, right? Think the story of the three angels that visit Abraham in the tent. So those angels look like normal people, right? They look like humans. They're dressed like humans. They sit down in Abraham's, you know, living room to eat, you know, dinner with Abraham. They then walk over to Sodom and, you know, talk to Lot and they they look like humans. And the Zohar is saying, okay, well, that's not really what angels look like, right? Angels are, are, are non-corporeal, right? Angels are spiritual beings. Okay, if an angel wants to come to this world, then it needs to take a form that we understand, and so what's a form that we understand if an angel wants to give over a message, right? It has to look like a messenger, right? And actually the Hebrew word for messenger and angel are the same, right? Malach, malach, right? So the, the angels come to Abraham and from Abraham's point of view, those angels look like three random messengers. 
But if you really understood the essence of those angels, you would understand that these are not just, you know, physical entities. This is not just a human. So the Zohar says, well, so too with the Torah, right? That the Torah in some sense is just the, the outer garb of, of the actual truth. And so if you read the Torah literally, it's not just you don't get the full understanding or anything like that. It's, it's actually heretical in some sense. And you miss the entire point of Judaism, according to the Zohar, if you're too focused on the literal interpretation of the Torah, because then you miss the entire secret of secrets of our tradition. It's as if you go outside and you're, you know, trying to focus on, you know, somebody else and all you care about is their clothing, right? This is another metaphor the Torah gives is, you know, only the fool when they're talking to another person is more interested in their clothing than who they are as a person, right? You know, the, and so the Zohar says, well, if you just think of the Torah as a series of stories and not as representing these deeper truths, you are like the person who is meeting somebody for the first time and all you're thinking about is their shirt as opposed to, you know, who they are as an essence. And so this, again, it takes the Torah from being a book of narrative and even a book of laws into this, you know, higher stage, really recipe for being able to unpack and understand the universe and then put it back together in some sense. So I, I only wanted to bring this source to show the Zohar is consistent with, with all things, that every single thing in Judaism that we do, whether describe God, talk about the mitzvot slash commandments, talk about the Torah, that there's always going to be the, the, the literal side, which is only scratching the surface. But then if you look past it, you recognize that virtually all of this is supposed to be seen as a metaphor only reflecting a deeper truth. And so the Zohar, in, in some ways, you know, it's it's been described by uh, modern thinkers as the uh, the first bit of Jewish heresy, because in some sense, the Zohar is is in a sense saying everything that Judaism describes is in some way metaphorical and in some way rep only representative of a deeper truth. But if you only read things too literally, you are at risk of, of missing the wider point. Um, so I wanted to bring this one text here. We have um, one more text that I wanted to do, but I wanted to take some some thoughts. I see that there's also a, a couple questions in the chat. Uh, okay, any other, any thoughts or anything like that? Yeah, it's it's kind of am I on? Yes, it's kind of like when you read a book for the fifth time during your lifespan, it it becomes deeper than when you read it first as a teenager. There's there's more to uncover than you originally saw. How's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I I think I think that's exactly right, and I think the the Zohar, you know. It would say that, you know, times, times a hundred that, you know, every single time, right. This is again, why, and, and again, the Zohar, the Zohar is simultaneously building upon the rabbinic tradition and also rejecting it in a way, right. It's a very interesting, uh, right. A lot of these ideas, if you, you know, for, for those who have read a lot of Talmud and Midrash, these ideas poke up a little bit within Midrash, right. So the, you know, <clears throat> there's a line in the Talmud that says, um, anybody who interprets the Torah literally, it would have been better if they would have never been born, right? A pretty radical statement, right? But again, even the Talmud is, is understanding that if you're so focused on the literal interpretation of texts, that text quickly becomes irrelevant, right? This is, you know, interestingly enough, this is connected to a lot of debates about the Constitution, say, in America, right? How do you understand the Constitution? Is it a living document? Is it not a living document? Jewish tradition in broad strokes comes down very strongly in the, if a text can't be interpreted, it has no value, right? And so there's no such thing as saying there's one interpretation of a text, right? You know, the, the Talmud over and over again, right? There's 70 faces of the Torah and there's Hillel and Shammai and, you know, they were both correct and a scholar needs to interpret 49 reasons why, you know, a bug is kosher you know, even though a bug is explicitly said is not kosher, right? So these are all statements in the in the Talmud and Midrash already. But again, like a lot of things in the rabbinic tradition, the Zohar kind of pushes this to the natural conclusion. And so the, the Zohar is concerned with 
both, right? It It's trying to redeem both Maimonides and Aristotle and Plato and the hyper-rationalistic understanding of the world and also the very anthropomorphic rabbinic picture of the world and says you can have both at the same time, just be careful understanding which one is a metaphor and which one is capital T truth. So at the end of the day, God is infinite, God is ineffable, and you have to understand every time you use God-centric language, that can't be capital T truth, that can only be metaphorically true. And at the same time, once you understand that, once once that is the backdrop to how you're viewing the world, then go ahead and be as vivid, as anthropomorphic, as, you know, almost, you know, artistic in your understanding of God as you want, because, you know, we've all read poetry before, right? The more descriptors and metaphors and adjectives that poems use, the better a poem it is. Even if at the end of the day, you know, that 50 line poem about love that's using, you know, colors and nature and, you know, descriptors, even though at the end of the day, when you close that poem, you know, that was a beautiful poem. Maybe that poem enhances your understanding of love. Maybe it, it allows you to think deeper about what it means to love somebody. You understand that poem is not love, right? That poem is only trying to describe something that's indescribable. So the exact same thing is true with, with the Torah and with Jewish tradition and the mitzvot um, and, and everything there. So yeah, thank you for that, um, Risley. Any other thoughts or questions in regard to Okay, so I want to do one more, um, one more source real quick. Let me just uh, pull it up real quick because it is not in this slideshow because it was a little bit um, long. While I'm doing that, if anybody has any other thoughts and or questions, feel free. I just got a new computer, so playing around with uh, how to open different um, tabs here are uh... okay. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, let me know if people can see this. Okay, there we go. So here is one of the one of the sources of the Zohar that I think will will start to get us into um into next week. It'll start to allude to what the Rosalie was saying before in terms of Simtum, um, in terms of really okay, you you learn all this, but the Zohar is a lot less interested in philosophic introspection than it is about action, right? Judaism fundamentally is a much more action-centric tradition than a tradition that sits around and theologizes all day. So here is how the Zohar tries to bridge this gap. So it states as follows. Rabbi Chia opened, right? So he gave a lecture and said, um, actually, sorry, let's start at the beginning because this is a uh, fun story. Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chia were walking on the way and a donkey driver was goading behind them. Rabbi Yossi said to Rabbi Chia, we should engage and ply words of Torah for the Holy One goes before us. Therefore, it is time to make an adornment for him with us on the way. So you have these two rabbis that were on a trip and they have a donkey driver that's sort of pulling their stuff. And one of them says, hey, we should probably study some Torah, right? All good uh, Jewish stories. So... What is the Torah that they shared? Rabbi Chia opened and he quotes this verse in the book of Psalms. It's time to act for God. They have violated your Torah, right? This is a very interesting verse. Um, this verse, by the way, has a uh, very interesting Jewish tradition. This is the verse that the Talmud uses when the Talmud defends the writing down of the oral tradition, which is seen as a big no-no, right? In ancient Judaism, there was the written Torah and the oral Torah, and there was a, a very strict law against writing down the oral Torah. And the rabbis in the Talmud came together and said, when the temple is destroyed and Judaism is going to be dispersed, if you don't write down the oral Torah, you're going to lose it. And so they applied this verse. It is time to act for God. They have violated your Torah, right? Okay. So here is what the rabbis say. Time to act for God, right? What does that mean? Whenever Torah abides in this world and human beings engage her, the blessed Holy One, so to speak, rejoices in the work of his hands and rejoices in all the worlds and heaven and earth abide in their place. What's more, the Holy One assembles his entire court and says to them, 
Look at the holy people I have on my earth, for my Torah is adorned by them. Look at the work of my hands about whom you said, what is man that you are mindful of him? And these, when they see the joy of their master in his people, immediately open and say, who is like your people Israel, a unique nation on earth? So Rabbi Chia says, when the Jewish people are doing what they're supposed to do, following the Torah, that God is, is able to basically brag to the heavenly court, right? Look at how great Israel is. But when Israel desists from Torah, his strength, so to speak, is weakened. As it is said in Deuteronomy, you have weakened the rock that bore you. Therefore, it is time to act for God. The righteous must gird their loins and perform good deeds so that the Holy One will be strengthened through them. What is the reason? Because they have violated your Torah and the people of the world do not engage perfittingly. So Rabbi Chia's interpretation of this verse, right? Just to uh, review, because we're going to get another interpretation in a second, is it's time to act for God, meaning the righteous people have to do good deeds because other people have violated the Torah and therefore weakened God. And so the righteous need to continuously practice mitzvot because God's strength is weakened by the people that have violated the Torah, right? Interpretation number one by Rabbi Chia, right? Still a, a very interesting verse in already with this assumption that God is reliant on human action. But here is what happens. The donkey driver who was goading behind them said to them, if it pleases you, there is one question I wish to know. So now, of course, this donkey driver is listening, is overhearing this uh, rabbinic discussion. And Rabbi Yossi says, certainly the way is adorned before us. Ask your question. And so the donkey driver says, regarding this verse, were it written, one must act or we will act, I would say so. But what is time to act? So the donkey driver says, there's a problem with your interpretation, Right. Your interpretation, right, if the verse was written, you know, we have to act for God or one must act or we will act, then that interpretation makes sense. But why does it say time, right? What does it mean it's time to act for God, right? Why bring in the variable of time? Furthermore, to act for God, it should have said act before God. What does it mean to act for God, right? So the donkey driver is now asking all of these questions on this interpretation. So Rabbi Yossi, who's one of the rabbis, says, with numerous hues, the way is adorned before us. First, we were two, and now we are three, and the Shekhinah is included with us. Second, we thought that you were nothing but a parched tree. Yes, you are fresh like an olive. And third, for you have asked fittingly, and since you have begun a word, say on. So Rabbi Yossi basically says, great, come and join the conversation, right? Okay, so now the donkey driver gives his interpretation. He says, right, quoting the verse, time to act for God, they have violated your Torah, right? Our verse from before. Um, if you've... If I've lost you already, I'll, I'll review again at the end. Um, this is the uh, cryptic nature of uh, both Midrashic and also Kabbalistic texts here. And you just kind of have to uh, plug forward. So the donkey driver interprets a time to act for God. There is a time and there is a time. As Ecclesiastes says, there is a time to love and a time to hate. There is a time above, and this time is a mystery of faith. And it is called a time of favor. And this is that a person is required to love God constantly, as it is said in Shema, and you shall love Adonai, your God. Therefore, a time to love, this is the time that a person is required to love. There is another time, and that is the mystery of other gods that a person is required to hate, and his heart should not be drawn after it. Therefore, a time to hate. And because of this, as it is written, tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come at any time into the sanctuary. When Israel engages Torah and the commandments of Torah, this time, this mystery of holy faith is arrayed in her array and adorned in perfection as it is fitting. And when Israel desists from Torah, this time, so to speak, is not arrayed and does not abide in perfection and light, and then time to act for God. What does it mean, time to act? And then I'll uh, give an interpretation. And it is said that Elohim creates to make, right? This is the uh, beginning of the story. That God, um, when God creates humans, right? God creates la asot, right? This is actually part of the uh, kiddush. What does it mean to make? The bodies of the demons remained for the day had been sanctified and they had not been made and they remained to make spirits without bodies. So here time to act remains unarrayed and without perfection. What is the reason for they have violated your Torah? Because Israel desisted below from words of Torah because this time abides either ascending or descending on accounts of Israel. For those that completely um, got lost at the end there, <laughs> what the uh, Zohar, 
what the Zohar is um, essentially saying here, or this donkey driver is bringing up an interpretation, is what this verse means, time to act for God for they have violated your Torah, is it's it's inverting the meaning of this verse, right? What this means is that the time itself, right, the order of the universe itself is unarrayed or is broken when people violate the Torah. And so God's actions within time, right, God primarily is the, you know, gives order to the universe. God created time, God acts within time, everything there. And that is pause, right? God's power in the universe, God's control over the functioning of the day-to-day is limited when humankind is violating the Torah. And so practicing of the Torah, according to at least this donkey driver, which the Zohar ends up accepting as uh, the center of its opinion, becomes about trying to reorder the cosmos into some some order and actually uh, saving time itself. So just to go to the end of the story and then um, we'll conclude. So Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Chia came and kissed him on his head, right? And so they basically, uh, you know, tell this donkey driver, thank you so much for sharing um, these words of Torah. So just to um, just to bring it bring it whole again, I'm sure that there's a little bit of uh, confusion here. And next week we'll talk. We'll we'll start with this idea of God, of the the brokenness, and then the re- the repairing of the world. But for the sake of just a uh, big picture review, and then you know if everybody's a little bit confused at the end of this, that's a good thing. If everybody's super confused, it's probably bad. But it's good to be a little bit confused because the Zohar itself keeps falling back on this idea of. If you think you fully grasped it, then you obviously have no idea what you're reading because the point of this is that it is non-fully graspable by by design. God is made imperfect by the nature of this world existing. And so there's no way for God to have maintained an infinite perfection to create a world that is by definition finite and imperfect. The very idea that we exist as separate from God means that God had to stop being whole and perfect and infinite. In that creation, in the story of God creating the heavens and the earth, the universe, humankind with free will, there was metaphorically a breaking within God itself into different aspects of God, the the infinite that still exists out there in the philosophic realm, but then also the tangible part of God, the Shekhinah, the Sfirot, whatever metaphor you want to use. And then it becomes the job of humankind to work, you know, as we just read, eight la hasot la Hashem, right? A time to act for God. It's not that it's a time to act for God because, you know, God wants us to do good things or good deeds or mitzvot. It's that God in some sense is reliant and the entire idea of God being made whole again can only exist if we are able to produce the en- enough good deeds or enough mitzvot in order to make God whole. And so the entire quest of the Zohar and Kabbalah, the entire quest of the Zohar and Kabbalah becomes this project of bettering the world and perfecting the world. This is where, you know, next week we'll talk all about Tikkun Olam. Tikkun Olam's gone through a number of uh, interpretations throughout the Jewish world. Obviously today, if you hear the word Tikkun Olam, usually people just interpret that as social justice. But the original idea of Tikkun Olam comes from, from here, comes from the Zohar, which is that humans actually need to go out and perfect the world and not just the world, but actually God, um, God's self. So I'll take, I know it's 1030 now, but I'll take a couple of minutes um, for questions. Julian asked if, uh, yeah, Julian, I'll, I'll send out the slides. Um, I think last week they were also sent out. Um, but yes, the slides will be sent out. But any other conclusory thoughts or questions or anything there? Amazing. Okay, well, have a wonderful Monday and have a wonderful Great. week. Um, I don't think we have class next week because it's Labor Day, but I think in two weeks we are back for our final installment of uh, Kabbalah. That's correct. Check your, uh, Chen, check the website. Um, you should get, um, if you're registered, you should get a, um, a, um, remind, a te- uh, email reminder on the morning of 
if you don't go to the website and sign up again and uh you'll get it you'll get it it's uh, basically the um I, I heard somebody say they didn't have the right link basically the link is the same every week so if you had last week's you should have this week's thank you rabbi this is wonderful of course thank you so much and have a wonderful week everyone thank you so much got a little further today <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get too far. It's a lot to learn.